All right. Good. There come some people. Good. Whoops. Okay. Good. That thing should be working. Okay. So there's a cyber club coming up on Tuesday the 19th. That's a week and a day from today. You can go to that if you want. I'm going to do the Android vulnerabilities thing I did in the Android class. So students will hopefully bring devices to test. And uh, red versus blue that Saturday, those are both worth extra credit. If you went to RSA or B side, just make it, write it down on this piece of paper. If you're here, and I can give you credit. Otherwise, you can email it to me. Um, those are worth recording. Record how many days of B side you went to. You could have gone to two days of that. RSA, I imagine everyone just went to the one student day. That's probably all you can do, unless you uh, actually got a a real pass. And let's see if there's anything fun in the news. I think there always is. Um, yeah, those are pretty funny. Um, yeah, there's a all pretty silly, but uh, well, there's a few, and I guess I probably have enough for some more. But anyway, so um, Elizabeth Warren wants to break up the tech giants like Facebook and Google. She's platforming in that. So when she announced that, Facebook took down her posts advertising it. And then they had to apologize and said that she was misusing their logo. And people are saying that was completely a lie and they were just taking it down because she was disparaging Facebook. So uh, that's about what you expect out of Facebook. They're always shooting themselves in the foot. Um, so two Boeing 737s have crashed. These things are so important to Boeing, like 4,000 of their 5,000 back-ordered products are these one airplane. This is like a huge part of Boeing's profits. So this guy here explained that they're perfectly safe, it's perfectly fine to ride them, and they're going to make safety improvements. And eight countries have now downed them. But small countries, major countries like the U.S. and the U.K. are still waiting for the FAA to make a decision. But a bunch of people are getting very upset, saying there must be something serious wrong with these planes. Other people are saying there's nothing to worry about. Move along. Uh, there will be, when Boeing's price, I saw one report, they already dropped 10% in a few hours. Because everyone expects them all to be down and Boeing to lose a ton of profit. So I did not know there was WPA3, but apparently there is, and here's a history of it all. Uh, WPA, WPA1 is perfectly fine as far as I know. It has some in principle mathematical flaws, but in practice there's no actual attack that does much of anything. But WPA2 is better. And I guess they've invented WPA3, but it says here, although it has technically been invented, you can't buy anything that does it. So it's uh, apparently even better because it transmits the key by near-field communication, so nobody outside your house can get it. And anyway, but they say there's nothing for sale yet with WPA3 in it, sort of like SHA-3. It's there in case we need it, but there's nothing wrong with the earlier stuff yet. Um, so... Uh, this is pretty pretty uh, common and outrageous. So Georgia is using voting machines that are famously insecure, that do not make a good paper trail, that cannot be audited, and they've been told over and over again that things are not safe, and they just say, shut up, just like the airplanes, we're going to use them anyway, get lost. A lot of states do that. I know Pennsylvania has also been using famously insecure machines, and they're just uh, Raffenberger. <laughs> is explaining that there's nothing wrong and you're just making it up and it's all fake and just shut up. And he claims they're going to save money and his statements about the amount of money it costs to use paper ballots are completely false. So he may be the next president with this sort of stuff. Um, anyway, uh, this one was pretty entertaining. Um, not exactly surprising, but kind of fun to see. They hired a bunch of developers on a freelance site to make like a, uh, a chat room or something where people would log in and they told half of them to make it secure and they gave the other half no guidance about security. And so what they did was horrible things, as you would think. Um, uh, there's a nice stereo. Uh, a bunch of them did plain text authentication and ones that encrypted the password used stuff like MD5 and Base64 and SHA-1, which we'll be mocking later on today in the lecture. 
and only a very tiny fraction of them used anything good like like PBK, DF2, and Bcrypt are the only things on this list that are even slightly valuable to conceal a password. All the rest are essentially the same as plain text in practice. Um, so this shows something that I found out years ago. I gave talks about password hashing maybe five years ago at developers conventions, and people would come up and argue with me that, that there's no point hashing them at all, and MD5 was far too much and stuff. Um, so not much has changed there. Um, that was exciting. Bart was down for most of a day due to the central computer going down. I never heard any more about it though. Um, this guy is pretty interesting saying there's been a 400% increase in data breaches in one year, which I imagine is probably true. They also say the total amount of data stolen per breach is smaller, which it could kind of have to be. Anyway, um, so this is, I don't know if people are just trying to sell products by, by exaggerating these numbers, but I think the numbers really are unbelievably bad, and that's why we all have so many jobs in this field. Uh, there's just more and more and more hacks making job security for all of us. And uh, it scares people enough that they will hire all of us, even though none of us can actually prove that we're doing anything to stop any of that. But you would like to think that putting on your patches and such would be uh, helpful. And the, only, the one thing you can do is quantify how much legal risk there is from hacking. That's the closest we can come to security metrics. And so here they are, a $5 million suit over Sonic's breach. But $5 million is really nothing. And this is why even if you try to say how much it costs you when you get hacked, the actual damages range from 50%, 50 cents per record to $200 per record. So I don't understand how anybody can sell cyber risk insurance or decide how much to pay their team or anything. It's just guessing all around. You have no idea. And if you're honest, one thing has been proven over and over ago, it does not seem to affect your stock price at all when you get hacked. It falls for like a day and then it comes back, which I must say, I think that's reasonable. I often prefer to shop at companies that have been hacked because they've actually improved their security ones. Ones that haven't been exposed to be hacked are probably being hacked and don't know it. But anyway, um, so North Korea is pretty much living by theft, and they're living largely by cryptocurrency hacking. They stole an incredible amount, like a billion dollars from cryptocurrency, 670 million in virtual currency. And that is, um, you know, they don't, it's interesting to watch. Uh, and there's a lot of evidence that they do a whole lot more of this. So uh, Udu is some kind of database product, sort of like Mongo. And it has some kind of default password. And this guy went and scanned for it on Shodan and found thousands of these things, 32,000 of them. And yeah, 32,000 32, total and 7,000 of them have the default password. So all the data is just blowing in the breeze. And a lot of them are in the United States up here, 2,000 of them in the United States. So, uh, this is sort of like open Amazon buckets, lots and lots of data just sitting there waiting for someone to take it. Anyway, all right. So we're down to chapter seven. I think we're up, we might as well carry on with this. So we're talking about session management. And we talked about how the web works before. You send these requests up to the server, an HTTP request, you get an HTTP response, and then the server forgets about it. And when you send another request, it has no idea who you are. It doesn't remember that you're different than anybody else. It's not remembering your IP address or anything. So this means if you actually want to have people log in, oh, there's a free course you can take which goes over the similar stuff there on Leak 7J. I think it's still free. I went through it and it wasn't that much more advanced than what we got here, but it is another alternative. Anyway, so this means when you log in and then you want to come back later and see like your email or your Facebook, it has to somehow keep track of who you are. And since the web does not have a built-in automatic way of doing this, you have to add it in your framework, and there are many competing frameworks with many different flaws. So if you don't have good session management, then people will be able to get into somebody else's session. Um, often it's very simple. Uh, for example, Gmail. When I went to DEF CON about eight years ago, they got in my Gmail. I was on the wall of sheep because I used Gmail on the DEF CON Wi-Fi network. Now they tell you, don't use the network unless you're nuts. And I said, well, I'll be fine, it's HTTPS. And it was HTTPS during the login process, but at that time after this, it went down to HTTP and identified you by sending a cookie, which I did not know. And I learned, all you have to do is steal the cookie and you can get in the session after they log in. 
And that's what they did to me. The hamster and ferret were the tools they were demonstrating that year. And you could totally get in everybody's Gmail and pretty much everything else at that time because Google's usually a leader in security and everybody else was even worse. So I learned something. Um, and that's an example of poor session management where you send an unauthenticated token, I mean, unencrypted token over the wire, and then there, anybody else can copy it and reuse it. Now, there are a lot of things you could do. You could send it over HTTPS, or you could even key the token with an anti-CSRF value so it includes something like your MAC address or your IP address. So if somebody just copies it, it won't work on their machine. That would also help. Uh, there's lots of things you could do, but at this time, Google didn't do any of those things, and neither did anybody else. And anybody that stole tokens out of the plain text traffic could just sail right into your accounts. So that's the point. Now, Web 1 was the original internet where you just put up things like images and pages that were not customized at all. There was no login, and you were just viewing things like posters on the wall. But after that, we got to Web 2 where everybody expects to log in, and uh, then they can do things like online shopping and email and such. So this means when you log in, you have to get a set cookie reply coming back from the server, and this will tell your browser to remember this number. Call something ASP.NET session ID, and then hopefully a lot of random things. Now, you could put something personal in there, like a username or a credit card number or a password, but you shouldn't. Now, there is no technological barrier to doing that. It's just a poor practice. It should be like this, just a meaningless random number. And that means the server has to have a database on the server of all these random numbers and who they correspond to. So that's the game. And every time I send a request back to the same domain, my browser will automatically send this cookie. Now that makes it easy for the server to know who I am. And it also makes it pretty easy for bad guys to steal my token. But that's how it works because I keep on sending my authentication every single request over and over again. So that's the thing. You might generate tokens that are easily guessed and you might handle them poorly so they can get stolen. And both of these are very common. ASP.NET often generates a token, but the app doesn't really use it. The app might set some other cookie that's more foolish, even though the ASP or PHP system is making an automatic token. So you can find out with Burt Repeater. Um, so if we look at, for example, Amazon. Now I finally went and put um, Foxy Proxy on my browser to try to make it easier. So I can go to Burp. And if I go to my Burp, which should be running here, Burp. There's Burp. I can clear all this old stuff. Okay. And if I go to Hackazon, oops, got to spell it better. Hackazon, there we are. And so I'm going to sign in. And I've got a username, Sam Test, and a password to Sam Test. So now I'm logged in. If I go to my account, um, well, I think somehow it can tell who I am. We're going to take a look here. So if I go to here, there was a login. And at the login, I sent up my username and password. Um, and this was not encrypted, although that's not the issue we're worried about right now. Then after this, it does a get for my account. And this is the one of interest because the response at the bottom contains my username and password. If I do the render, I think it's easier to see. Um, the response from the server has my SAM test here. So it knows who I am. So the question is, how does it know who I am? And the easiest way to investigate it is to send it to the repeater. <coughs> this is usually the fun way to do it. And now you can see the request here. And you might as well switch to parameters. Here's all the parameters you had. Visited products a Cloudflare ID and a PHP session ID. So in this case, it's pretty obvious that it's this PHP session ID, but you can make sure. So first let's run this and make sure that it still recognizes me. Now this by itself shows that this is a pretty sleazy site because it really shouldn't let me replay things. It ought to have some kind of counter or something to know if this is a repeat of the same request. This means it's vulnerable to a replay attack. I could just capture somebody's packets and replay them to get in. But anyway, it still knows who I am. And so I will um, remove the Cloudflare cookie and replay that. And it still knows who I am, which is not a surprise because I know Cloudflare is not the, uh, is not the authenticator. And I'll remove this list of visited products. That's not how it remembers who I am. So if I do this, there we are. So it still knows who I am. So the only number it needs is this PHP session ID. And I can try changing that number. It has a six at the end. If I change that to a seven and go, now it doesn't know who I am. It just says 302 found 
a redirect page telling me to go log in again. Send me back to the login page. It no longer knows who I am. So that's what you'll usually see. And that PHP session ID looks really long and random, so probably this is pretty good. And I imagine it is because it's automatically generated by PHP. It's not like the developer wrote that. That's just some automatic PHP library, and it's probably reasonably random and such. So uh, that's that stuff. Um, you can also, I used to be able to do this at Amazon. Amazon seems to have HSTS on now, so it's not convenient to do this live. But I went to Amazon and logged into a real account, and then I had all these, to, all these parameters, and I tried deleting them one by one to find out which one was the real important one, and I found it was this one called XMain, which is a lot, that's the only thing it needs to have to know who you are. So that was fun, and I actually had some homework in a previous class where people were trying to get in my Amazon account. It turns out Amazon is pretty, Interesting levels of security. You can do a lot of things that I thought were poor practice, but they won't let you do it too many times before they lock you out. So their defense is not to block things like replays, but to block too many repeated logins. Anyway, um, so there are other ways to do this. Micro, there are various automatic ways besides cookies. You can have basic authentication, digest, and NTLM, and these all add something to the request automatically based on your Windows login and are typically used inside Microsoft domains. Um, and they amount to about the same thing. Uh, they hash your password in some way to send it up. Basic just base64 is it, and digest and MTLM hash it with other routines, all of them pretty old and weak, but they are the systems that Microsoft's had for decades. And then there's sessionless state mechanisms. This is a way to remember who you are entirely, so the server doesn't even need to have a database <coughs> remembering these numbers. So I'm gonna pass your whole profile to you and you're gonna give it back to me with every request. ASP does this with view state, Java has Java serialized objects. Uh, this is a way that's much more convenient for the server programmer because they don't have to have some kind of memory of what you're doing. And it's very handy if you have multiple servers that are administered by different people that don't have permissions on them. So I can't somehow communicate my memory of your state over to the other server. So I just bounce it off the client. So you'll find you can add things in an array and then you put it in the view state. So you can just add all this junk into the view state object and it goes down to the client and you can have all kinds of things inside this view state. It's just a data structure that can contain all the data you want and it just shows up as a long blob of base64. Unfortunately, in early versions, it was not encrypted. In later versions, it comes with an authentication tag, which is an HMAC, which is hard to forge. So um, it can be pretty secure if you're using modern versions. Um, early versions, you could just unpack and modify with a perp extension. So that's the game. Uh, so then there's Facebook token generation, and this looks pretty good. Let's look at this one. This was 7K. So I'm going to turn off my proxy and go to 7K. This guy got $10,000. That's right, $15,000 from Facebook for this. And he doesn't explain it at all. He makes a video which doesn't show you much, but it does show you how he does all this work. So he went to Facebook and he found some page in Facebook. <coughs> where you have to reset your password and they email you a six digit code. And so if you know the right six digit code, you can reset your password. What he found somehow is that the six digit code is not random at all. In fact, it's in a short range. So um, the code there he found um, always starts, it only, um, it's based on just the number of seconds or something because the first three digits are always the same. Turns out it was only varying the last three digits. So if you just try a thousand numbers, you'll get in. <coughs> now, if you had the free version of BERT, it won't let you do this inside BERT. You'd have to write a Python script, and he paid for the pay version of BERT with some of his fifteen thousand dollars. You know, he got from life. And now he can run the automatic attack, and there it goes. And this is how BERT does it. It just tries every possible parameter: eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, and it just records the length of the response. This is the simplest way to tell which one got in. And they'll generally all be the same length, except for the one that gets in, which will be a different length. So this takes like five minutes. For some reason, you recorded it all. BERT automatically finds the answer. And for that, they gave him 15000 bucks. What's that? Uh, this is Intruder, I think. Uh, 
What? It's, I think it's intruders. Let's take a look at it in live burp here. Um, so if I look at my real burp here, there is intruder. And in intruder here, you can define a position like here, P3 and P4. You define the location you want to attack this way. And there are different attacks. And this one I think is called sniper. There's sniper, battering ram, pitchfork, and cluster bomb. They're talked about in your book. And these will try various kinds of attack. They'll just put different values in here and try them until you get in. But all of them run incredibly slowly in the free version of BERT. Is that, is that those, are those the parameters? Yes. You specify here what's going to... So let's try sniper and then start attack and see what it does. Payload <laughs> list is empty. Right, i got to set the payload list. Um, and payloads are here. So I can have a simple list, say... Uh, um, I'm not sure what I can do for simple things. thing I know is I can just put in um, here. One, two, three, four, five. There we go. It'll try those options. And now I think I can run it. And there we are. Some functionality is disabled. It's actually time throttle warning me that it's not going to be much fun. But there it goes, um, supposedly, starting. And it looks like this one is not set up well enough. Yeah, there it goes. Incredibly slow trying zero with some payload, and it'll try various options. Um, this one is not much fun. I could probably do a little better. Let's do Hackazon. Oh, it's doing one of 25, there it goes. So it's trying five values in the first position and five values in the second position. So there it is trying them, one and two and so on. These are going nowhere because it didn't bother setting up the original thing too well, but that's all it does. And just to irritate you, it waits like 10 seconds between each one to make you pay like 300 bucks for the professional version of BERT. And you can, of course, um, just write your own script, too. But that's all it does. Um, and if you pay for the pro version, it's pretty fast. And that's what all the pros do. All the people that make real money in bug bounties, they <coughs> use, learn all this stuff. What is scripting? What's that? What is script Well, it writes the script for you. You'd have to write your own script. So after you write the script, will you, will you spin it in? Oh, not in Burp. I just write my own Python script outside Burp. Although you could, in fact, do it with BERT uh, add-ons and such. There should be somebody to stop the stinking attack. I'm not having any luck doing it. Clear start. Okay, maybe I finally got it to stop. Anyway, um, I think I saw a chat message come through. Okay, methods like OAuth. Yeah, they get a number from Facebook. Um, are all these numbers on the server? That's a very good question, and I don't really know the answer. It could be that it is a pseudo random and random sequence like the Google Authenticator, and they're just remembering the scene on the server, or it could be just a table. Either one would be okay, as long as they use a good pseudo-random function. Um, I haven't looked inside those apps. Uh, many of them are open source, so you could find out. It's a very good question. I do know, um, we'll get through a little later, I do know that in general, about half the online logins have no way to de-authenticate a token. So I suspect it may be done with some kind of uh, pseudo-random sequence. So any number that's in the sequence can never be invalidated. We'll get there. That's a problem of cookie reuse. All right, so let's go back to the slides. And um, so here's, let me uh, shrink this thing up. Okay. So you had password recovery tokens coming. Um, you can use hidden foreign fields. And this is the game. There's also resistant tokens to remember who you are. Many uses of tokens. And all of these depend on the token not being guessable, not being predictable from other tokens, uh, so that nobody else can forge them, because if they could, they could get in other people's accounts. So one thing that people have done in the past, I think it is not that common anymore, is put meaningful tokens. This looks like random numbers, but it's not. It's just hexadecimal words spelling things out. 75, 73, 65, 65 is an E, and so on. This is just spelling out readable stuff, user equals DAP, app equals admin, and so on. Um, it looks random, but it's not random at all. And once someone spots the pattern, they can easily forge a token that's meaningful um, just by looking up ASCII tables, ASCII values. Uh, people often put the username, an American identifier, email address, uh, accounting predictable number, a timestamp, and so on in the token. And of course, all those are terrible because you just have to gather a few tokens until you spot the pattern, and then you can get in. People often encode the data. You could encode it as just raw hex like that, or you could XOR it with something to conceal it or put it in base64. 
All of these make it a little less obvious that it's not random, but they're none of them really any good, and you can easily reverse them all right inside BERT. Well, I think BERT won't do the XOR, but it will do the basic before the text for you. So obtain a token, just modify it. Change, a, change one character at the end, a character in the middle, that's gone, then try it again. If it's really random, any change will make it not match, and it'll never be accepted like that PHP section ID. But if it is some kind of meaningful data, then you'll find that it'll accept modifications because most of the modifications will hit a part of it that doesn't matter. And that's the game here. And Burp has a thing called Car Throbber to try this for you. So another thing, log in as several users at different times, and just record the tokens and look for patterns. If you can register similar names, that's, um, then you can see if it's got the name in the output somewhere. Um, look for correlations. General rules, if you're putting repeating letters, you'll see repeated encoding characters with any of these simple transformations. Base64, you can spot by the equals and double equals at the end. They're there two thirds of the time. Um, so try guessing other things, find a page, then go to Burke Intruder and try many options, and you may get lucky. So let's try a Kahoot. I may have to pay for Kahoot. They're gradually making it more and more annoying to use if you don't pay it. They turned off the search function, so all you have to do is scroll through all your Kahoot's hunting for the one you want now. That's why I'm glad I kept backups of all my Kahoot's. Right from the start, I was afraid they would go broke one of these days. And uh, when they're down to annoying the user this much, I think that means they're on the way down. Anyway, on 129, oh, I got favorites. They still let me use favorites. So once I scrolled through about eight pages of junk and found the ones I wanted, I was able to bring them more or less to the top. All right. So here's the sound. Okay. The equal at the end is pattern. So sometimes there's no equals, sometimes there's one or two. It's for padding. Yeah. The, the real way to spot it is that it's always uppercase and lowercase and numbers and a couple of symbols. And base 64 doesn't have any letters after A, B, C, D, F, and so on. So that's the main way to tell. But the equals is handy. Most of the time, it'll have an equals in there. You don't actually have to put the equals in because it can tell from the length how many equals should be there. Some, in, some versions of it require the equals. Others will just fill it in for you. What's that? Fix the sound? Oh, well, that's because, and we were in a room where I was using the other kind of video. The HDMI kills the sound. This is using VGA. And I'm not sure of any solution for that HDMI issue yet. I'm using a different adapter. If I use an adapter that has an HDMI port, even if it's not plugged in, it grabs the sound and won't give it back. I did, in fact. But there probably is some way to override it in the settings, and I haven't found it yet. Anyway, I'll give it a few more seconds. Looks like that's it. Okay. So, what encoding turns that user equal A, A, A into this kind of job? That's base 64, uppercase and lowercase, and there could be numbers in it. That's base 64, it looks like that. One really strong clue is the upper and lowercase letters, because hex would not make a difference between upper and lowercase letters, and letters beyond F. That pretty much means it's got to be base 64 or possibly XOR, but XOR typically creates unprintable characters and punctuation marks. It's very rare. It would not take readable text and turn it into other readable text, not very often. Anyway, um, all right, so what kind of coding converts it into something like that? That's MD5, it's, a long, it's not hexadecimal, because hexadecimal will just have one hex code per character, and that's much longer. That's a whole long hash, and the hash is always the same link, no matter how long the input is. That's the properties of MD5 and SHA-1. So, 
you can actually count this and you can tell which hash it is pretty much by the length. MD5 is 128 bits, SHA1 is 160 bits, SHA2 is 224 or 256 or 512. So you can count them out. It's four bits per character. So this will be 32 characters if it's MD5. All right, what coding turns it into that? Okay, that's hex, and this is on my hat. AAAA is 41, 41, 41, 41. We'll use it a lot in 127 next semester. This is typically how you tell when you've succeeded in hacking into a server. You inject a lot of capital A's into a field, and when you see it come back in a register, you know you found a buffer overflow or another convenient way to take over the machine because you see the hex codes come back that match that character. All right, and what kind of encoding does that? Okay, that's what XOR looks like. It turns the A's into fives, but it turns each byte into the same thing for the simple one byte XOR. So XOR just means you flip some of the bits. And so you flip enough bits to turn an A into a five, and that happens this many times, and this is the result of flipping other bits. The total length remains the same. And uh, all right, that's what I wanted to show you. So can we record the winners of that? I've got Caitlin and Chris. And Winnie will have to tell me who they are if they want points, but we got more to do here, so they have more time to do that. Okay, so uh, your tokens may be predictable. So if you just get a sample of tokens by logging in and out several times, you might see a pattern. Like I think that guy with his Facebook discovered that the first three digits never varied. And this might be Winnie the Pooh identifying themselves. It is. Uh, I, I have Chris, that's what I figured. Chris is actually a real name. That's fine. Good. All right. That's what I figured. Chris looks good. It's Winnie who's going to lose their points. In there. Anyway, so um, oh, they might come cough up the names at some point. All right. So Burp will try sequential payloads. It tries uh, 7B122, trying various requests here, and tells you which winners appear. So it's trying them all, 01020304, making a long list, and then the ones that win go to the top. The ones that are 302, it figures fail. The ones that are 200 win. So here you see it's logged in as Herman, administrator, Babina, because Burp was able to find the name in the response. So this is your best case, where it's actually able to tell that you got in and tell who you are. Um, often it's not able to do such a good job of understanding the result. It'll just be a different length. Anyway, let me check the chat. And aha, good. Good, okay, thank you. I now know who Winnie is. Okay, good. Thank you. In the same place where you were. You gave it a list of things to try. That's why I, I set up from one to five. And you, you do the same thing. It's Burp Intruder, I think. I think it's Burp Intruder. Um, let's go here. Uh, yeah, Intruder has this option. And you can specify the payloads here. You can just put in a list. And it'll try all those lists in all the locations you choose here with these percents, these section signs. So you specify what to vary. And I think you can somehow tell it what part to interpret as the username and such in the response to. But I'm not quite sure about that part. Like I say, I never reuse it because it costs 300 bucks. I just write my own Python script if I want to do that. But uh, it's, um, it's just a convenient way to do what you could do yourself with Python. All right. And so here's things that might happen. You might just have counting numbers. That would be obvious. You might have concealed sequences. This is what a lot of cheap random number generators are. They're not actually random at all. They're just jumping ahead by a large number, and you're looking at these small digits that keep rolling over. And then there's things with time dependency and weak sources of randomness. So here's a sequence that looks base 64 encoded. But if you decode it, it just turns into random junk. So this is, in fact, a concealed sequence. It's not base 64 encoded. It's just a hexadecimal value that is counting up. 
So what you do is if you calculate, the, interpret these as numbers and take the difference between them, you'll see that the difference is always 97C4EB6A or FF in front of it and then that. So it's jumping forward by some number of millions here and wrapping around and you're keeping just the low digits here in base 64. So this is what's called linear congruential generator. This creates something that appears random, but in fact, there is a simple pattern. And in fact, once you know the pattern, you can take any two numbers and predict all the rest. <coughs> so you can write a simple Python script to do it here, it just converts it to hex, gather the digits together, calculate the difference, and so on. You can very easily do this in Python. Python is very friendly for this because Python understands hexadecimal numbers natively. So you don't really need to convert them back and forth to decimal. So you can now generate valid tokens from Python. Yeah. Is that in Python 2 and 3 or just in 3? In both Python 2 and 3. In fact, I always use Python 2 for everything. I never use Python 3. Because the only, the only thing about Python 3 is it handles international languages. If you're happy with English, Python 2 is fine. All right. Like Let's, ASCII, yes, you got ASCII, but if you want like Arabic and Chinese and stuff, you got to use Python 3 and everything gets a lot more confusing. What numbers in this example are they subtracting? Um, okay, uh, let me go back to that example, uh, which is here. Um, you're just subtracting these numbers from each other. These are the raw numbers. And um, here, what you do is subtract, turn these numbers into base 64 and subtract them from each other. These can be turned into numbers. Base 64 is just another way of representing numbers. And you can subtract them from each other. And then you'll get a difference, which is longer. So I mean, these are, um, base 64 can be reversed to, I should be more careful in my statement about Python. Python understands hex and decimal as raw numbers. If you have base 64, you have to decode to turn it into a number. But it's just dot decode, quote, hex. So um, you've got the script there. You can take a look at it. Like a built-in method? Yes, it's just built right in. It's very handy. You don't need to import a library or anything. You can do it by, either I did it the old fashioned way by importing base 64. Later on, I learned you can just do dot decode quote hex and quote base 64. It's very nice. Yeah, let me do one. Right. Yeah, let me do one live here so it's clear. So let's set up one here. If I blow this up, okay, let's have Python. And now let me just get a couple examples from this slide. Um, let's see if I can get two of these typed in without giving me a headache. Um, let me zoom it up. Okay, so if I make A equals 9708D524 and B, oops, I need to match my quotes. Okay, and B equals 2ECD. Actually, those look like the differences. So let me, let me go back to the previous slide. Here we are. Let's start with these and let me see if I can do it live. If not, I'll have to... Uh, Tell you next time, but let's, I think I can do it. This is A equals one W J V J A and B equals L S three A J G. Okay, so those are base 64 things. Now I can do A A equals A dot decode base 64. And it tells me it doesn't like the padding. So let me put in, um, it needs four digits. One, two, three, four characters of base 64 turn into three characters of uh, three ASCII characters. So I need two equals to make the coding right. So now I should be able to do that. Now I can print out AA and there it is. See, A is now a series of hexadecimal bytes. And I can now do AA dot D dot, um, that can be interpreted as a raw number. Um, although I'm not sure I know the easy way to turn it back into a raw number. Um, hex of AA, I don't think it's going to work. No, all right. I, I don't, it's not quite as easy as I thought it was going to be. Um, that's what all this junk does. I had to pick out the characters one by one with this thing. So uh, it is, I think I'll just leave it at this script here. You have to go through and pick out the characters and build the hex back up. That's why it's, here. This is what picking them up and then multiplying by 256 to build the number. You take the hex uh, and turn it, build the hexadecimal number, and then get a number out of it. 
and you can subtract them. I think I won't do more of that because it's a little bit annoying, even in Python. Python makes it as easy as it can be, but it does get a little confusing. Anyway, that's the point. Those base 64 things turn into hex, and hex things turn into integers, and you can then subtract the integers. Anyway, there was another question here about encoders that obfuscate malware. Um, in malware, you use all these techniques. However, um, lame malware will use something native like base 64 or an XOR encoding. A smarter malware will do something custom, like you can take a base 64 encoding and you can scramble the letters so that it reverses like the A and the X so that it's not decodable with standard base 64 libraries, although it's logically the same. Um, and we'll, you'll see that in next semester if you take 126 when you do the malware analysis. Malware very often uses these very simple encoding schemes with a small trick put on it, and the only point is to make it so people can't easily find the strings and just sort of give the analyst a headache. All right, good. I hope that helps. These are very good questions. And let me see if I can get this out of here and uh, let's see what we got here. Good. All right, so. Anyway, uh, here's time dependency. The left number is just going up by 1, 8, 49, 40, 41, 42. The right number is going up, but only in the last couple digits. This is very much like that Facebook example. This looks like a really long random number, but in fact, only the last two digits are changing. So it's really something like the number of seconds since the last person logged in or the number of milliseconds since the last person logged in. So that means you can know that somebody logged in at a certain time and know they're between these two and then you only have to guess maybe 400 guesses to guess their token. It's not random enough at all to stop people from getting in. So if you wait and come in 10 minutes later, this number is jumped by six, but this number is jumped by 600,000. So you can guess that the thing on the right is milliseconds and the thing on the left is uh, minutes or something. How do you fight, uh, how do you fight guessing the token? How do you what? How do you fight guessing Oh, well, you should not use a sequential token. If you're going to have a sequential number, you should do something like MD5 or SHA. So it's just random. Your token should be completely random. Every person that logs in should get a new token. There's just a new random number, not in any way patterned off the previous one. And you could generate it from something just counting up, but then you'd run it through a pseudo random generator, like so, a hash function. So by getting a, a random number for the login, that effectively stops them from being able to guess because it's going to switch it every time they try to guess it? Yes, that's the idea. You want, you want to make it long and random so only a tiny fraction of all possible numbers are valid. And you might even include like a checksum in here so most combinations of random numbers will be recognized as invalid. Like you might make the last two digits equal to a combination of all the rest so that only 1% of all possible numbers are in fact valid at all. Yeah, because I was just thinking like if you were saying okay, maybe there's only 40 or say like 400 tries. Yeah. How does the machine not pick up that somebody's trying 400? Oh, that's, a, that's another big one, a very good point, and it comes up in every chapter. You should notice if somebody is trying over and over again to log in the same account and kick them out. But they usually don't do that by default. You have to add that. If you pay for something like a web application firewall or a modern layer 7 firewall, it might add that in. But um, otherwise, you have to think of it. And by the way, there's another solution there. All you have to do is run to Tor, so your IP address keeps changing. And if you have a list of a thousand users, don't keep trying to get in the same user, keep picking random user. And then it'll be really hard for the server to tell. But attackers that don't do that, you can easily block them by just blocking anybody that makes 10 failed logins in a minute or something. And that worked at CCDC, that's what Caitlin did. She took something they were attacking, and move the real panel to another page and watch when people came to try to log in and that meant they were bad guys and we blocked them. Quite effective. If the bad guys are doing something very simple, like coming from a fixed IP address and going right where you expect them to go, and of course, most attackers are just doing simple, straightforward attacks. And those are the ones you can stop. The clever attackers, you can't stop. Like you're never gonna stop the NSA, but you can stop average criminals. What, what was your modifying? What's that? What was your modifying? It was a Raptor, some kind of control page. Yeah, it was a control page that was supposed to be for installing this movie, but it was exposed to the public. So what I did is I um, moved it to another port that only, and so that, so that, so that only internal IPs could access it. But I kept the old page up as a decoy so that if people started playing with it, I would know, oh, this person is trying to play the Raptor page. You know, they should not be there. So it's, 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 it's,
That's when my Microsoft was so enamored of these. Microsoft made a patent about six years ago for a home honeypot. Like everybody's going to do this on their home network. That never happened, but it is pretty appealing to think. You put up a trap and catch the bad guys. Anyway, so you pull the secret server, pull the server frequently, get a lot of session tokens, and then watch and see if a number is counting up. And if it counts up by two or three, that means somebody else logged in in between and you can get in their account. It's one simple way to do it. Um, so there's a lot of weak random numbers out there. It's actually very difficult to get a random number from the computer. Computers do not generally have anything random. Everything is systematic. So if you do some kind of math to create something random, it's usually not very random. And many people have made this mistake of using some simple algorithm like the linear congruential generator and treating it as random, and it's not random enough at all. So um, PHP had another one. They would generate a token from the IP address and the time and microseconds and a linear congruential generator, and that's not very random at all. If you have a clue what time somebody was logging in, you can start chasing through the microseconds. It won't take too many guesses before you get it. So the bundle release found in 2001, Sammy Kamkar was the guy that wrote the tool to get in. He wrote quite a few tools. He wrote the MySpace worm. Um, I don't know how this guy avoided prosecution. I think he might be in another country. Actually, I think he's in America now, but he did an awful lot of illegal things. Like he made the first MySpace worm that infected like uh, 10 million MySpace pages or something. Did a lot of famous hacks. I don't think he went to jail, but he certainly could have. Yeah, he crashed MySpace when he was 19. Anyway, he was banned from the internet. Oh, I guess he did get caught. Anyway, um, so that's the quality of randomness. You know, how do you know how random something is? This is actually quite difficult. Here's Dilbert with a thing that just gives you nine, six times. That doesn't mean it's broken necessarily. How many times you have to be very careful? What's the test to decide if something's random? It's pretty hard, actually. So you start with the idea that's randomly generated, apply a series of tests, and then for each test, you take the probability of this happening if it was random. And when that probability gets small enough, then you say, I don't think it's random. So Burp has a thing called Burp Sequencer that will try to do this. And it will do many requests and then try to tell you which ones are not varying. And it's often the case. Here I've got a, what looks like a 64-bit number, and the first several bits never change. So they're red. Uh, this is quite common, that you're mixing the other numbers, and this is like the high order bits of a time or something. So none of those change. So even though you have a 64-bit number, you do not really have 64 bits of randomness. You have less. This is in BERT? Yeah, it's in BERT, but I don't think it's in the pre-version. So yeah, I doubt this would be in the free version. I haven't tried that. Um, anyway, so then there's encrypted tokens, and this is good, clean fun. And I learned a lot from this. This is how I've been doing a lot of hacking in Android apps after I learned how to find encryption this way. So this is what people often do. They take meaningful content like the username, and then they encrypt it with a secret key, and then they use that for token. Now, that sounds pretty good. And if you couldn't find the secret key, it might be strong enough, but it turns out that if you don't use the right kind of encryption, it doesn't do you much good. And the simplest mistake people make in all encryption is using electronic code book. We're mocking it heavily in the uh, encryption class. Uh, this is what's called textbook encryption and it indicates somebody that doesn't come from the real world, they come from a college where they learn some math in a textbook and they haven't considered the consequences of the real world. And the problem is if you encrypt an, an image this way, you still have, can recognize the image because it takes blocks of input um, that are typically 16 bytes long and just encrypts that. And it takes the next 16 bytes and encrypts it again. And if the two 16 bytes are identical, like white and white, you just get the same answer over and over. So it preserves patterns. So this is not what most people would call encryption. It hasn't removed the information in the image. It's just changed the colors and blurred the edges a little. But this is what you get with electronic code book. So if you have a meaningful field like this, a random number, an app, a UID, which determines who you are, then a username and a time, then you encrypt it. Even with electronic codebook encryption, it will look all meaningless because there is not a group of 16 characters that's repeated here. So it looks completely random, but it's not. And what happens is, if here's the plain text, there's eight bit blocks, eight byte blocks at a time. And what this means is, since there is no randomness, I can rearrange these blocks any way I want. If I want to move this big number, 236, up here, I can put it up there, and then my UID will change from 218 to that big number. 
because each block remains valid even if you move around because that's the problem with electronic codebook mode. Each block is encrypted independently and there is no random factor. So you can rearrange blocks of text and you might be able to create meaningful combinations. Another reason why this works is a general property of the web that if I pass you a series of tokens, like a series of values like RAND, APP, UID, it's often the case that the only thing that matters is the UID and the app doesn't really know or care if RAND turns into just random garbage. It's okay that certain parameters are destroyed in the process of adjusting one. So you can copy a whole block like this one. And now I had a 992 someplace up here that from a random number, I put it down here and now I'm gonna be logging in as user 992 instead of the user I should have been, which is 218. So now I'm getting in some other random person's account. Now typically the administrator is the first person created with account one. So if you could put a one here, you'd be the administrator. And that turns out to be pretty easy to do because your username is down here and you can adjust the length of your username to make it wrap around to give you only one digit here. And then you can make 10 requests until you get a one. So that's the game here. So I carefully choose a username. And I'm looking for a one here. I want to hit UID equals one. I want a one there. So I arrange my name to be such I could even just put a one in my name. That would be one way to get there. Then this wraps around, I get a one here. So now I have a block that has a one in it. So I put it up here. And so now UID equals one, time equals 6119, username equals DAF. The rest of this is sort of garbled, but I've created UID equals one. Without knowing the key and without decrypting, I've managed to create a meaningful token for someone else's account. This is gonna happen with almost all hack functions in this class and the uh, encryption class. You can often forge a message which will still be meaningful even though you can't read the message or decrypt it. Uh, this is called existential forgery. You create a message that is valid even though you don't have the key. So the cure that most people use for this is cipher blockchain. If you get done being stupid enough to use electronic codebook mode, the next thing that everybody goes to is cipher blockchaining, and this is what almost everybody really uses all the time. And the way it works is you have a key, and you also have an initialization vector, which is not a secret and is transmitted in plain text along with the ciphertext. You add this initialization vector, you XOR it with the plain text before encrypting, then you take the output and XOR it with the next block of plain text, and that output is the IV for the next block of plain text. So now, even if I have identical blocks of plain text, they will be XOR with varying values, and so it will come out random. That's why people like it, because it causes the image to turn into just random snow. So it no longer preserves proper patterns in the input. The problem is this operation combines ciphertext with plain text with a very simple XOR operation, and that is too simple. That is too easy to reverse, too easy to control, and there's a whole series of attacks that target this simple operation, which mix plain text and ciphertext together, and your attacker has access to the ciphertext. So they can do things that they really shouldn't be able to do. And again, there's a forgery attack, an existential forgery attack. Even though we can't read it, we can again forge something that's meaningful. And in this case, it's extremely simple. So you have this token containing values, you encrypt it, and it looks perfectly random. But if you just change one byte here, you change one byte here, the decryption will scramble it, and you'll destroy 16 bytes here, but it will only change one byte in the next block because the only use of this hypertext in decryption is to XOR the next block. So I can now change one byte. So all I have to do is change the byte that controls something like the number to the user ID, and I can eventually create a meaningful value there. So uh, that's the point. If, I'm, if I can tolerate having 16 bytes of collateral damage, I can change the output one byte at a time. And all I have to do is hit the right byte to have a meaningful effect, like put a punctuation mark after the first digit of the username, and now my user ID will be only one, a user number, my user number will now be only one digit long. So that's the game, and this is a very simple attack. You just change the bits one by one. So here's the example of altered values. You'll have this, and um, if you look over here, this, this letter is changing P to Q, then this is changing to A, and this is changing to Q, this is changing to U. I'm changing one character over on the right, at the cost of creating 16 bytes of junk in the middle. All I think is using eight bytes with block here. So by creating, destroying eight bytes of something, 
I can change one character at the other end. And for many web requests, there is an option where you change one character and it is still meaningful and it goes into somebody else's account. So you can modify a session token like this, but this way, and Burp has an option, I think in the intruder again, to do this. It will try flipping every bit in the payload. It's bit flipper is the attack. It'll flip each bit one by one. Wherefore, it's not that difficult because if the um, eight requests per byte, so if you have you know 30 bytes, it's only 30 times eight, 240 guesses, that's not a huge number. Yeah. Uh, I haven't tried it. I'm not sure. It might be. I, mean, I assume it's probably crippled in the free version, but I haven't tested it. Anyway, so that's the game. It flips things. Many of them are invalid, but some of them are going to end up as other users. Like here I am ending up as Peter and John. So two of them actually ended up getting in other people's accounts. Of course, it's a random process. I don't really know what I'm doing, but if you just flip one bit at a time, you will hit some random other people. And that's a horizontal privilege escalation where you go from one user account to another that should not be allowed. And it happens because you use a meaningful token and you pass it through an encryption routine that doesn't really scramble everything 100%. If you were, for example, to hash it and then encrypt it, this wouldn't happen, but then you couldn't reverse it at the other end. If you really had just a random number at the on the server, then you wouldn't have any issue here. Anyway, that's the game. So. Um, Another thing that happens fairly often is there is some kind of encryption, and the same encryption routine is used elsewhere. So there's some place where I can put in something and I see the ciphertext, so I can use their encryption routine. This is often the case in malware analysis. They have some kind of encryption. You don't even need to figure it out. You can use their encryption function to decrypt stuff. I've done this with PHP malware many times. Um, all right. And so let's try some cahoots about that stuff, and then we'll take... A 10 minute break. So let's close this one and go to 7B. All right. few seconds, okay. So what system makes replay easy? Hmm. Crypting meaningful data. All right. I'm not, um, hmm. I don't understand that one, I must say. Doesn't look like anybody else understood it either. Seems to me like you could do it with any of these. Oh, I guess the point is okay, I understand it now. It took me a while. This one has nothing random in it. The ones that have time or something in them, you just keep using different values for each person. If you're just encrypting meaningful data like the username, then it never changes. So all I have to do is remember it and play back exactly the same encrypted stuff. The rest of these do something to make it fair. So I guess that's fair enough. All right. So which one do you exploit by rearranging blocks of cybertext? <coughs> That's it, electronic codebook mode, where every block is encrypted independently, so rearranging the blocks still remains valid data. Which one do you exploit by changing a single byte?
That's cipher blockchain. For one block affects the next block, and changing one byte will change one byte in the next block. Which one uses one block of data to influence the encryption of the next block? That's the chaining. That's the chain. One block is used as the IV for the next block. So we should take a 10 minute break. We'll pick up at 710. I'll leave the share going so people can ask questions while I'll pause the recording. And if there was, there, there, there have been no cyber arms limiting agreement that means anything. Nobody even knows what it would look like. They might have signed some paper, but it doesn't mean a thing. They're not quiet. There's a huge battle going on. It's just not obvious. You read this book is a good start. There's several books about it. There's been a hot cyber war going on for about 10 years, and that's why they're hiring so many of us. That's why everybody's getting hacked. Military weapons are leaking out. That's why there's so many powerful tools. Anyway, so, um, all right, there's no bit of this to do. So we'll talk about, yeah. That's a very good question, and I haven't heard any explanation yet. Well, I haven't looked at it. Why did they give away Gidra? It's a very good question. It is interesting. I would assume it is probably for public relations purposes. So they can say we're not just evil spying on people, we do good things now and then. Um, I, maybe it's because they figured that it's out of date compared to whatever the secret one is, and we'll use it just to stop all the attacks from other people. I don't know. I'm sure they'll have some public statement, which will probably be a lie, explaining why. The real reason we will probably never know. It might very well be that it already leaked, so they might as well give it away. That's probably what it really is. But they'll probably say they did it out of kindness and goodness. And they already have a much better version anyway. I'm sure they have something much better than what they give away. They would be nuts otherwise. But as far as, as, far as the uh, China being quiet, China what was it, a few months ago uh, hacked and just, uh, all of the personal addresses of our military and yeah, the our civilian government employees and then dumped it on the web. That yeah. Puts, uh, millions of federal employees at risk. Yeah, the OPM hack and other ones. Yeah. It's not useless. That's how you use it. That's not what they want. They want the secret stuff. That's how you get the secret stuff. No. Here's how you get a hold of the people. Now you know who works where. Yeah. Now you can blackmail. But this is, in fact, a very good point. That's why that was probably an amateur. A professional intelligence organization would steal the secrets and keep them secret. Dumping it for the whole world to see is an amateur. That's why it was strange. Um, that, that's, that's not something you'd expect from the military. They would keep it secret and hope that you don't know they stole it. Then it makes it more powerful. I think it was an action. Yeah, that could easily be. Uh, the Russians carefully dumped stuff just to cause embarrassment during the time of the election. That's what the shadow brokers was. Yeah? There's no way to website. No way to what? Uh, not bulletproof a website? No, not really. That's the problem. You can do things like put on web application firewalls and strong authentication and such, but nothing is perfect. There's a way into everything. How do you prevent what? Yeah, you can turn on defenses like Cloudflare will protect you from DDoS and the web application firewalls will protect you from some other attacks. But just like in the physical world, there's certain kinds of armor you can get, but there's always something that gets through it. So you have to do threat modeling and decide who you want to stop. If you're trying to stop a nation state, you're in deep trouble. But if you're just trying to stop, say, script kitties and low-level criminals, that you can do with things like firewalls and antivirus and encryption. Uh, I think we all have to accept that nation states were just helpless against. The only one that can save us from nation states is perhaps the military, and they aren't doing much to save us. So. You just have to hope that the nation states don't go after you because you'll never stop that. Yes? I, had a, I gave a ride to the airport to a Stanford grad student, a specialized in security and security. Yeah. I naively said, uh, you know, oh, there's got to be a way to you know, create a, a really 
straw and secure it to block anything. He laughed at me and he said, you know, the problem is code was never designed to be secure in the first place. Yeah. It was just designed to do proceedings. So security was not in the front of their minds at all. Well, you could so, say it's because they didn't plan for security. I would just say, take it the physical world. Suppose you really want to make sure that nobody shoots you with a gun. What can you really do? What can the president do? What can the pope do? The answer is you can have a few secret service agents and hide behind plexiglass, and they can still get you. Get you with a drone, get you with poison. You know, there's no perfect safety anywhere at any level. If your adversary is powerful enough, they will punch through whatever defense you have. So you have to do threat modeling. You have to accept there are some things you can't stop and say, what is it that I could stop for a reasonable cost? And only worry about that. You have to admit that the level of security the Secret Service has is amazing. You know, like, they do like the best kind of identical limos. You know, what you sure. Get in, oh, sure. The Secret the Service. Curtains, so when sure. it's out, you can't see it. You yeah. Know, it's really the Secret good, Service you know? is very expensive and they do a very serious job of trying to protect the president. And still, I think we had four or six presidents shot and several killed. It's so nothing you can afford will make you 100% safe. You just have to do threat model. That's what we're here for. You have to make a calculated risk. It's very important. This is something you often have to do in management. Management will say, I want 100% uptime. I want perfect safety. And you have to explain to them, you can't afford that. There's nothing you can buy that will give you that. So we have to talk realistically. Maybe you can get 99% uptime, maybe 99.9, .9, maybe 99.99, and those will come at different prices. But there is no option of 100. And there's no option for bouncing all these actors. Like, with the, isn't there a certain raid design that you can use that'll give you continuous backup, so that way if they knock down one of your systems, you can leave? Yes, of that's how you make high availability. You have backups, and you have some system of switching to the backups, and they all have a failure risk. The Five Nines Hosting Center, the 365 Main in San Francisco, promised Five Nines, which means five minutes of downtime a year, and they went down for four days. Amazon went down for four days. Nobody can do it. Nobody can actually achieve five nines. I only heard one company that ever did it. it was an insurance company in Texas. Wasn't there some super secure, like Fort Knox style um, data center in, in Vega? Oh, there's another one in Europe. There's an actual abandoned nuclear um, facility that can withstand a nuclear site, nuclear bomb, and they're putting servers in there. There's people putting servers under the ocean. There are people trying to hide them where no one's going to take them down to try to hit this magic five nines. But I don't think anybody's ever done it. Um, anyway, so here's a common myth is that SSL makes everything secure. You'll see my site is secure because I use SSL. Well, all that does is encrypt data in transit. And it does it pretty well. So the chance of anybody stealing it while it's being transmitted is pretty small. Only the highest level attackers like nation states and large criminal organizations have the ability to forge SSL certificates or steal them, really. But the problem is... Um, you can steal the cookie without getting it while it's in transit. Um, for example, you can uh, your token might be transmitted without encryption. If it is transmitted without encryption, you can sniff it anywhere on the wireless network of the ISP. If, if they use two-factor authentication, this makes you stronger. Um, if you steal a second token, you might still be able to do it. And for example, cross-site scripting runs a script on a web page in your browser, which sends a copy of the token to someone else. So it will encrypt it on the way to me. The fact that it's encrypted doesn't mean I can't steal it. If I can do code execution on your machine, and almost 80% of sites have cross-site scripting vulnerabilities, where there is a way to run JavaScript on your machine beyond what the developer intended. Um, and so here's another, this is what happened to Gmail. They, they would have you log in with HTTPS, but then they would go back to HTTP later. And so the token was in fact transmitted insecurely for part of the session, and you could steal it at that point. Um, then there's upgradable tokens. This is a uh, thing people do sometimes. You connect, and it sends you a token. Then you log in, and it elevates your privileges, say to administrator, but you keep using the same token. So the token that was at one time considered a low value token is later interpreted as a high value token. And this is not wise. You should issue a new token when their privileges change, but people often fail to understand that. And um, if you use a back button, <laughs> then you might expose the token. Um, and what's, uh, there's SSL strip is another attack. We used to do it in the 123 class. I don't know if we're still doing it there. But you can run a proxy. <laughs> Burp, by the way, can do this. Burp can connect over HTTPS and serve the page out over HTTP. It's an option. So you'll see it unencrypted in your browser. And it's unencrypted on the way to Burp and encrypted later. This is a convenient way to avoid those SSL errors. 
And you can do it on the web too. So where people will see an unencrypted version of a page, but the server will not know this happened because a later stage of the proxy encrypts it. Yeah? If I want to create a, a very secure uh, specific page for like an e-commerce site or a bank, yeah. can I, uh, through code, disable the back button on the user? Not really. The question is, can you disable the back button? You can uh, use JavaScript to block the action of going back, but if they turn off JavaScript, it won't work. So um, you can't really stop the back button from working. But what you can do, which is better, is you can put a varying hidden parameter on every page so that if someone tries to resubmit a previous page, it won't accept it anymore. It'll only accept a fresh copy of the page. Each page can only be used once. Then you have to refresh it. That's the way to do it. Then you know that they really hit my pages in order without modifying. Is that difficult to set up? No, it's not that hard to set up. And it's the recommended solution. And I think we got a picture of it coming up. So uh, then there's mixed content. This is very common. You'll have web pages that make HTTPS and HTTP on the same page. And if they do that, it's almost as bad as just being HTTP all along because the HTTP portion can be modified. You'd never know. So they can put scripting added into that. So it should be 100% HTTPS, all the content on your page, or it's not very safe at all. And then of course, even if they use HTTPS on everything, I can just do social engineering, send you a link and you click on the link, then you ask your browser to send data to somebody. And this works almost all the time. This is typically how you do it. You just send people email with a good enough trick. They'll click the link and hand everything to you because they don't understand That's your your Yeah. And then, so here's the deal, walk through your app, record all the URLs, look at the session tokens, and uh, see what's happening. You can look in the history and see the requests here. And I think I've got, um, there's also secure cookies. So let's take a look at that. I think I you know, got some examples of this. If I go, um, let's go to here. And I think I'll start by running it through Burp. And if I go to ad.samsclass.info, and then um, token insecurities. Okay, let's take a look in Burp. Okay, if I go to proxy history, I'm gonna clear the old stuff. Okay, now here's a login page, user and password. So if I, now right now, if I alert document cookie, I have no cookies. So I've just made a box that will pop up, there's nothing in there. So I have no cookie right now, okay. So now I log in as user with password. And it says, welcome user. Let's look and see what happened. What it did there was I sent a request, a post request, and the post request set up my username and password. And the reply to the post request came here. And if you look at the raw reply, it set a cookie. This is a meaningful cookie, username equals user. And that's all. It had some default values for the rest, which is the expiration time set. So it set a cookie in my browser. So when I came back to see the welcome page, my request included this username one equals user parameter. And this page found that parameter coming from me and printed it on the page, welcome user. That's how it worked. This is, of course, a very simplified version of how it works. And that's fine. But you could make a better cookie. And here's an example of that, HTTP only and secure. If I log into this one with user and password, I get an error message. It doesn't know who I am. Now that's because I wasn't secure. If I go back and view a secure version of this page, I'm gonna turn off the proxy and load a secure version of the same page, which is gonna be HTTPS and attack. Okay, that's the same page. And if I go, uh, let's see, I followed it up somehow. Um, I just go to attack. Okay, go here and go to um, token insecurities. Okay, if I go down here and log in with the same page, now it recognizes who I am. And the reason it recognizes who I am, if, if I go through BERT, let's send that through BERT. So I'm gonna turn on BERT. I'm gonna do it again. It's gonna whine about the certificate, so I'm gonna tell it to accept the certificate with advanced uh, add exception, and I don't need to permanently store it, but I do need to confirm it. So I told it to go ahead and go through BERT. Now I'm user. Let's see what happened in BERT. What happened is I logged in here, 
with my request containing the name and password and the response from the server set a cookie with username two equals user, but this cookie was set with these two flags, secure and HTTP only. You can add those to a cookie, and if you do, it makes it much more secure. The secure flag means this cookie cannot be transmitted over HTTP, but only over HTTPS. And the HTTP only means this cookie will only be sent over HTTP, and you cannot reference it with JavaScript. So that means it did work when I went for the attack. Because this connection was secure, my browser did send the cookie in the next request. You see it here. It sent the cookie containing the username, so the server knew who I was. It did that because this was HTTPS. But if you go back to this page, this browser now contains the cookie, but if you try to alert document cookie, you can't see it because JavaScript can't see the cookie. So I can't use alert to steal it, and um, I cannot send it over HTTP. However, you are trusting the browser to honor those flags, and you don't know if the browser honored them. So that's, uh, that's an issue. But anyway, that's what those flags do. They're pretty valuable. And down here is one you'll do in the homework where you have a, uh, something encrypted with electronic codebook mode. This is the one that has all these. So by this random number appearing here as six, you can just refresh this over and over, do this over and over until you get a one there. And when you get a one there, then you have a block of text with a one in it. So if you can arrange to make user ID wrap around, you can put that block down here and you can change your UID to one and log in as root. And you'll be doing that in one of the projects. And there's another one there with the other kind of encryption also, which you can practice in where you flip the bits one by one. So that's the game. These are secure cookies. A secure cookie is one that is stored in your browser the same way every cookie is, but your browser is told not to transmit it except over HTTPS. As far as I know, all browsers do actually do that, but you could certainly write a browser that didn't, and the website would not know that that had happened. So that's the game here. Um, all right. And uh, HTTP strict transport security is the new hotness. This is what you're supposed to do. You add this to the header of your web page on the server, and this tells the browser to memorize the um, fact that this page came over HTTPS. And in the future, always load it over HTTPS and do not go to HTTP. That makes you quite a bit safer. Um, and it turns out, a couple, I think about a year ago it was, no, January 18, about a year ago, 6% of websites were using HTTP strict transport security, which is recommended. Um, now, another issue is disclosure of tokens. We've said many times in this class where you're probably getting tired of it, you should put secrets in the cookies and in the parameters. You should not put them in the URL. You can put them in the URL, but if you do, it's bad, so you can search for it. In fact, I wonder if I can find any live examples of this anymore. People do clean them up, but they're more, there's always another, there's a sucker born every minute. Oh, let me turn off the proxy. I don't need that. So no proxy and Google. Let's try in URL, J session ID. I have to probably copy this. Okay. Well, look at that. Now, this is just things about J session ID. Um, let's see if anybody actually has a real, yeah. Maybe you should try to because they're not going to filter like Google. Oh, no, Google, I, if Google's filtering, that would be new. But I can try DuckDuckGo. I highly doubt it. I've never seen DuckDuckGo actually better. You think it will be? I, I know that like, Google will uh, rearrange um, the well, search. I'm, really, I'm willing to try it. No results. I don't think they honor the in URL. So you have to find their advanced search wherever it is and figure out what it is. Um, anyway, I may not find any good ones with here. We'll see. I just wonder if I can find one. Oh, an old one. You said they picked them all? Yeah, well, you never know. Um, yeah, it looks like they're blocking it here. How about PHP? Yeah, I'm not seeing a real one there, but there might be. Uh, no, there are, anyway, I'll have some examples here. Um, anyway, here I tried it a while ago, and I found some logins that had it. Um, the login register, and pe this is, people have visible logs, and people often do. 
And there's another, there's another thing that's fun is there's a product called Elma. Let me see if that's, that's an old one. If I do Elma, Elma is some kind of thing that um, micro, see this is what Google does. They notice you're a hacker. But um, there's Elma is a log, logging thing that makes a web page of logs from Microsoft servers. And uh, Toyota used to have an open one of these where you could totally see their Elma um, logs. And so you could see you know, error logging tools and people configure it often so it's totally visible. So if you know a better Google dork, you can find it. I'm not seeing one right away, but it used to be pretty common. And so people would have visible error logs and the error logs often contain cookies. In. So Microsoft. it works on startpage.com. Found it in four pages. Ago. Oh, good. Neat. Let's try it. So he says uh, in URL, I think it's in my clipboard. Okay. And then start page. Okay. Um, startpage.com. Uh, in the search is the search engine. Oh, start page is a search engine. I didn't know there was such a thing. Neat. A good, a good, oh, good. New thing to know. Neat. He said he found one here. I'm like, for, this is the new one. I did not know about this. A new kind of search engine. Good. So let's try fourth page or so. This is awesome. Um, Tokyo Stock Exchange. That's pretty interesting. Um, and uh, session at Amazon login, Gene Lab for high schools, uh, web form for Dun and Brad Street, online registration for a bank. Well, let's see how these look. These look pretty damning. And right there it is, J session ID, right up there in the URL. Holy crap. That's pretty impressive. Startpage.com, huh? That's a good one. Here's another one. Yeah, it's totally got the J section ID right up there. This is a really bad idea, as you can see, because it will get indexed. All these have them right up there. Boy. But how do you use that? That's the cookie to get in somebody's session. You put that in the cookie and send a request to the server. So make an account and log in, see where the cookie goes. You can put in that cookie value. Now you have somebody else's valid cookie value. And we're going to bring it up. Stealing a cookie is often more powerful than stealing a password because it typically cannot be invalidated at all. Even changing your password doesn't cause the old cookie to quit using, quit working. So this is a really bad idea. Yes, it is. It's, um, that's pretty impressive. Why, well, thank you. That's a good thing to know. Um, yeah, well, I'm not going to go any further, but that's the, um, but let's save the, I'm going to save the start, start page though. That's a good thing to know. News, right? New search engine. That's right. That's a new search engine. engine. Exactly. Start page is a useful, yeah, I a useful. Uh, I don't know about that. A useful. I'm sure there is. Just Google it. <laughs> but this is, looks like, it's like, um, you know, um, uh, the other search engine. Oh, yes. There's a search engine that searches not the content of web pages, but the server. I forget the name of it now. And this is another one like that. Um, there are search engines that look for technology, not for content. And they're quite useful. Anyway, um, it's Shodan. Shodan is the one everybody uses. And this start page looks like it's an interesting competitor. So anyway, if you have put data in the URL, it will appear in the browser logs, in the web server logs, in um, the favorites, it'll appear in the referrer. If you're on a page and go to another page, it'll be in the referrer, in the request sent the next page. You're just spraying that data all over the place, going to other sites, there's none of their business. You're not supposed to put secrets in there. So here, for example, the referrer has a J session ID in here, and you're sending it to some other server. It's just unsanitary, it's the wrong place to put secrets. Because the browser- look up and see what results you Microsoft. Yeah, I don't know. My, it's an interesting thought. Microsoft has always been much less secure than Google. They only switched to HTTPS very recently. I wouldn't be surprised if the Microsoft search engine is far less vigorous at noticing when you're obviously hacking. As Caitlin was pointing out, Google pretty much notices. If you go to like the fourth page of results, they start putting up captures and saying, you look like a bum. Uh, anyway, so that's the referrer page. We'll leak that data. And um, 
Another thing people often do is allow users to have two sessions open at the same time. Uh, use static tokens that are the same every time. These are common mistakes people make. And here's flawed logic. So if you um, have a token value that decodes to this, um, it may accept the same token value with a different user, which means not understanding what the token does. Um, terminating sessions is very problematic. When you log out or close your browser or time out, what happens? The answer is often nothing at all except it deletes the cookie in your browser. The thing on the server remains the same. This is the case of about half the sites I went to. There was an article that came out a couple of years ago about how Office 365 had this flaw, and I went and tested a bunch of websites. About half the websites had this flaw that you could, I could steal a cookie and then log out and still get in with the old cookie and change my password and still get in with the old cookie basically forever. A lot of websites work that way, um, which is a really bad idea. So that's cookie theft and cookie reuse. Uh, there's another one that's kind of baffling. I actually was able to do this a couple of times, although I wasn't able to get too far with it. Session fixation. I can put a cookie in the login page, and your browser will just accept it, and the server will let you provide the session ID and just accept it. It'll say, oh, you've already got a session ID from somewhere. I'll just go with that. This is what happens if you have a sort of disorganized website where there are several different servers and nobody on one server really understands what the other one is doing. So they'll look, if you don't have a session ID, I'll give you one. If you have one, I guess you must be continuing a session from one of the other servers. I'll just let that happen. So this means I can craft a fake login page that assigns your session ID, or I can send you a link with the session ID and the URL. And when you log in, I know your session ID because I gave it to you. That's session fixation. Kind of nuts, but it is an option. And then there's cross-site request forgery, which is the most common thing, where I trick you into submitting a request that sends a cookie somewhere else. So uh, this is the problem with liberal cookie scope. The entire browser security model relies upon the same origin policy, which means your browser thinks it knows where it is. So if I go to this URL, it thinks it's at samsclass.info. So it will send to this server the cookies for samsclass.info, and it won't send it other cookies. So if I can fool the browser into being confused about where it is, it will send the cookies to the wrong place, and there are a dozen ways to do that. Um, and so also, if I set it for a domain, it'll typically go to all the subdomains. So cookie set by games.samsclass.info will be sent to food at games.samsclass.info, but not to just samsclass.info. Subdomains are domains that get longer by adding more stuff to the left. Um, so that's a game you can set a cookie for the same domain or a parent domain, but not a top level domain like .com. And so if you blogs.com sets a cookie and each user creates a blog like Joe and Sally that blogs, then I could steal tokens of other users because the cookie applies to the whole domain. Um, to fix it, you'd have to create a different server name here that's different than like joe.com and set the cookie at this level. Then joe.blogs.com could not steal the cookie from www.blogs.com or from sally.blogs.com. You have to pay attention to the structure of the URL to control the cookie scope. That will help prevent this. What's that? Uh, it is just the way you specify a cookie. When you set a cookie, you can set it either for the whole domain or for a subdomain. But you said that uh, up here, if you set a cookie for um, blogs.com, then that cookie can be sent to any of these people. So that means one person can steal another cookie. The right thing to do is set a cookie just for joe.blogs.com, a separate cookie for sally.blogs.com, and don't set them up at this level. What's that? Yeah, when you set the cookie, when you set the cookie, you specify uh, the domain. You'll see it here in. This, when I did the post, in the response, here we go. It's setting the cookie, and it's secure, and the cookie is set for the domain this came from. So this cookie is set to attack.samsclass.info. And you can add more parameters to control the domain it's set for. So that's... Usually when you log in. Yeah, when you log in, you set a cookie. Uh, the setting a cookie is done by including this header in the response, set cookie. So any response from any server can set a cookie, but it will apply to this domain, the domain that set it. 
The difference here is these people, uh, the, pro the mistake these guys made is they used blogs.com for the login page. What they needed to use was www.blogs.com for the login page. That's why you do it. Because if you use the naked domain for login, then it will be sent to every subdomain. But if you have a special subdomain just for logging in that's different than these subdomains, then the cookie will not be sent there. It's different from blogs.com. So if you set the cookie on blogs.com, it can go to both of these sites. But if you set it on www, it can't go to either of those sites. So that's that's the containers issue. Uh, there is a, this is a reason. This is a reason for it. This is why you might need it. You want to this is why you might want to keep it exactly. Anyway, so um, and here you can specify the path. There, that's the path at the end. Specifies what path this cookie applies to. Anyway, um, then there's securing session management. So I mean, this is the general rules. This is we talked about all the attacks. This is all the defenses. It's just the same thing upside down. So make strong tokens, protect them. Um, Use a large set of possible values, create a strong source of pseudo-randomness so people can't predict it. Uh, there should be no meaning or structure. It shouldn't have anything encoded about the username or anything. It should all just be a random number. And on the server, it should be a table that the user can't get at. Um, you can use user agent, time, source IP, port number for randomness. And then you can add a secret not only to the server and then hash it all. This is a fairly good way to do it. And if you take the cryptography class, we're talking about these pseudo-random functions. This is how you make them. Um, only send things over HTTPS and only over HTTP, and not over JavaScript. And uh, when you have a logout function, you should invalidate that token on the server. So that if somebody submits a logged out session ID, it will no longer be accepted. Um, a session, your book says sessions should expire. I know banks do this, and I think nobody else does, because this is so annoying for the user. Um, don't allow multiple concurrent logins. Always generate a new token for each session instead of reusing old ones and so on. Uh, pay attention to the domain, the path, and cross-site scripting. And um, if you get any kind of funny data, then cancel the session and make them log in again. That is one strong defense that is missing. Like I say, you shouldn't let somebody try to log in a thousand times, and you shouldn't accept some kind of garbled login request. If something's wrong with it, you should kick them out and make them log in again. That means they're doing something fishy. Two-factor authentication, of course, is much better than even if someone stole a cookie, they won't have the other factor, and that's much better. Um, hidden fields, I mentioned before, are better than session cookies. They're on the form, and they randomize the form each time. So even if someone uses a back page in their browser or saves the page locally, it's never going to work because it won't have a fresh, random, hidden field in it. And um, these are called per page tokens. You put a random number in a hidden field on every page. Every time you refresh it, it changes and you validate it on the server. That means you make, are making sure the person is submitting this data from a fresh page that came from the server and not from some kind of replay like Bird Repeater. And so you'll see something like this. Here's a per page token. That value at the end is just a long hex value that changes every time. So they add that value to every page and they know that you're going through the steps, customer ID, customer reference number, you know, that's what you do. That's how you can mark a page so you know a genuine page that came from the server from some kind of replay or imitation coming from a script or BERT. And of course, you should be logging your network traffic and kicking people off the server if they're doing fishy things. These things are all pretty obvious if you know to look for them. Um, terminate their obsession if they're doing weird things, modifying the hidden formulas they shouldn't be changing, adding funny characters like apostrophes in, um, putting in things that are longer than they should be. You know, if there's fishy data coming in, then kick them out. And if they do it a certain number of times, then you block their IP for a while. That's, that'll show them. You can't use you can't use the this computer to your advantage for if they try to log in from another computer that doesn't match the computer ID. No, you often can. That's a very good, this, remember this computer functionality, if it's correctly implemented, it will include like a hash of your IP address or something, but if they're sloppy, it'll just be a cookie and you can copy it to another location. That's what you should make it so it includes something tied to that machine. So they can't, which is not that hard to do, but you have to think of it. Okay, that's a very good question. 
Somewhere back here, I've got the hoops. There they are. And seven C's, where we're at. And this is the end of it. So, a lot of good questions. Let me get rid of this bar there we don't need. Email what? I was checking your uh, sender information and you're, you got three kinds of logs. <laughs> I don't know about that. Coax, there you go. All right. I'll give it another few seconds because I think uh, I got most of the usual clusters, but I think I had more than 11 last time. However, it's kind of late. A few people may have gone to sleep. I'll give it five more seconds. All right. So, what does HTTPS prevent? Okay, you can't snip the data right out of the air. That's all it does. All right, what defense prevents users from clicking through an SSL warning? HSTS, strict transport security, means it has to really use the right certificate and it won't let you override it. What defense protects cookies from theft by JavaScript? Like that alert box that was popping up. HTTP only. What should a logout button do? Okay, it should terminate the session on the server. Most of them just delete the cookie in the browser. And the, cook, the session on the server continues to be valid, which is pretty bad. All right, what type of session token is not sent on every request? Hidden fields are sent only on that one page, not on just every page. So that makes them more secure. That's another way to pass it back to the user. And if a server receives a request with a modified hidden field, what should happen? Kick them out, they're up to no good. All right. So that's it. I'm going to record these. And then, of course, I'll go upstairs to see if anybody needs help. These are real names, so I know who these people are. Caitlin again. And uh, A. Levy. All right. Good. So I've got that information. OK, and if you uh, went to B-Sides or RSA, let me know. You can send an email to the same place your homework goes. Tell me how many days you went to B-Sides. It's going to be either one or two. And RSA is probably one day unless you actually were able to go more. Um, it's worth extra credit for sure. What's HSTS? What's that? HSTS. Uh, HTTP Strict Transport Security. It's a header field you put on your web page, and it tells the browser to memorize the certificate and not accept the different certificate. There's a chat coming in. Okay, thanks. Okay, good. All right. Well, I'm going to um, shut down the share then and go upstairs. See you folks later. Online, people face to face, I might see a little more of.